<clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Dominic Preziosi, editor of Commonweal. And thank you for attending this live virtual presentation of Commonweal's John Garvey Conversations, Spirituality in a Time of Reckoning. Uh, we're happy to welcome you back for the third and final discussion in our series exploring how our individual and collective spiritual experiences might move us toward a place of transformation and healing after a year in which the accumulation of loss, isolation, and division has for so many people been difficult to understand and respond to. Uh, today's Spirituality in a Time of Reckoning panel will feature a discussion on metanoia. I'm very happy to have with us today as our featured speakers, Father Brian Massingale, the James and Nancy Buckman Professor of Theological and Social Ethics at Fordham University, along with Janet Ruffing, a Sister of Mercy and Professor Emerita of the Practice of Spirituality and Ministerial Leadership at Yale Divinity School. Their conversation will be moderated by our own Matthew Sittman, Commonweal's Associate Editor, and in just a moment, Matt will introduce you to our panelists. But first, I want to let everyone know that all three of the conversations in this series are available for later viewing on YouTube. If you missed our first two or would like to watch any of them again, you can do so. Just see the link in the chat feature. A couple more housekeeping items. As part of the webinar settings, your video and microphone are turned off. Chat is disabled, so please direct all questions to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you have a technical question, also send it to the Q&A. Commonweal staff monitoring the Q&A will be able to answer your questions. I'd also like to offer this reminder about all of our Commonweal events. They are free and open to the public, and they wouldn't be possible without our readers and subscribers. The support and encouragement we get from friends and readers of Commonweal are indispensable. If our independent lay run voice matters to you, we invite you to support us with a tax deductible donation. To see the donate link in the chat feature or go to our website. You can also continue to be a part of the conversation by subscribing to the magazine, signing up for our newsletters, listening to our podcast, and following us on social media. Your help is a big part in everything we do. Uh, and once more, I have to thank the folks here at Commonweal, my colleagues who've put this series of events together, especially our audience development team, Milton Javier Bravo, Gabriella Wilkie, and Adriana Melnick, along with our publisher, Tom Baker. Finally, let me also thank those who've agreed to take part today, our moderator and our panelists, and also all of you for joining us. So now, without any further delay, I'm gonna hand things over to Matt Sittman. Thank you, Dominic, and thank you to everyone for joining us. I'm really excited for this conversation, which is our third, uh, as Dominic mentioned, in a series we've titled Spirituality in a Time of Reckoning. And uh, the two guests uh, we have with us today are, are two people I'm really excited to talk to. Um, this is one of the perks of my job is having interesting conversations with people I think are, are, are smart and have something to say. Uh, and as Dominic mentioned, our, our two guests are Janet Ruffing and Brian Massengale. I'm just going to give you uh, you know, remind you of their biographies, and then we're going to get into it because we only have an hour and, and we have a lot to talk about. Um, uh, Janet Ruffing is a Sister of Mercy and Professor Emerita of the Practice of Spirituality and Ministerial Leadership at Yale Divinity School. She has published five books and numerous articles on spiritual direction and supervision, mercy spirituality, female religious life and leadership, cataphatic mysticism, prayer, and other technical topics in spirituality. Uh, Brian Massengale is the James and Nancy Buckman Professor of Theological and Social Ethics, as well as the Senior Ethics Fellow in Fordham Center for Ethics Education. Prior to his appointment at Fordham, he was Professor of Theology at Marquette University. Uh, professor Massengale is a leader in the field of theological ethics and is a past convener of the Black Theological Symposium, Black Catholic Theological Symposium, and a former president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. Uh, welcome to you both again. Um, uh, I want to uh, begin by asking you both about metanoia. Uh, again, this series is titled Spirituality in a Time of Reckoning, and I think people have a sense of what we mean when we say reckoning, right? The past 18 months, the pandemic, uh, then the murder of George Floyd and the protests and uprising that emerged out of that. Um, it's been a time of, of grief and loss, of anger, vision, and uh, a, a time when it feels like uh, problems that had been long festering, long simmering, were exposed in some kind of way. 
And when we talk about metanoia in this context, I think we're, we're looking to build on the past conversations we've had about um, grief and anger. Um, and I don't think I need to give much more context for that reason. This is, again, you can go back and watch our previous conversations. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, we don't really need too many reminders of what the past 18 months have been like. Uh, so I would begin, uh, maybe Janet, you can go first. Um, you know, grief, anger, metanoia, this third term, it sounds a little different. Uh, for our viewers, could you just give a sense of what metanoia means, perhaps especially in this context? And then Brian, maybe you can follow off of Janet's answer and, and kind of uh, give us some of the wrinkles. It's a complex word, it's a different kind of word. Maybe uh, you know, we could explore it some and get that basic definition for viewers down right here at the start. Metanoia, what does it mean, especially now in this context? Unmute yourself, Janet. Yep, I just, I just saw the notice there. Um, Pope Francis really named this for us as you designed this uh, series of conversations as being a time for metanoia. And one of the things that I think is, well, let me just give you the Greek meaning of all of this. Metanoia comes from the Greek New Testament. It means literally to change our minds or our dispositions. Um, it's, and, and it is in terms of our behavior. So in the New Testament, most often it's repent, but repent is a weaker word than metanoia. Metanoia is a whole change of perspective. Metanoia is a change of behavior, a change of uh, understanding and a change of heart. So in the New Testament, it's repent and believe the good news, but that meant to become a complete and total follower of Jesus. And so we're asking ourselves in this series, <clears throat> what, what is the kind of um, authentic Christian change that's required of us today to really be living the gospel under these circumstances and at this stage in the pandemic and at this stage in our country, which continues to be pretty messy. I really like the way Janet began by talking about metanoia and it's oftentimes that will be translated as um, repentance, but we also use the term conversion, also as a synonym for uh, metanoia. But I like to keep the word metanoia because conversion, I think, has become too domesticated. Um, you know, we talk about celebrating our conversion journey, uh, but we often, but conversion in the deepest sense of the term, as Janet said, it means to become a new being, a new person. In the New Testament, we, we hear about becoming a new creation. And so what does it mean to become a new being, a new creation, both personally and collectively, in light of this um, world-changing experience that we've all lived in various different ways? Um, to relate to what Pope Francis has been saying, Pope Francis often talks about that we're living in not an era of change, but a change of eras. And so we're moving into a new turning point in our personal lives, in our national lives, in our global lives. And so the call to metanoia means not just to simply change, but it's a very deep change. It's a fundamental reorientation. It's a fundamental reset. And so in light of the New Testament, when Jesus comes and he says, the reign of God is at hand, how then are we to live in the light of the inbreaking of something which is radically new and radically different? And what kind of changes are we are called for in the light of the kind of drastic experiences of COVID, of racial reckoning, of political polarization, we could add January 6th to the litany of things that we've, that we've been through in the last 18 months. What are these calling us to? What kind of fundamental new directions are they calling us to in terms of our personal lives, our national lives, and our lives as Christians in the United States? Thank you both. Uh, I have a specific follow-up questions for each of you. So um, Janet, I'll ask you a follow-up first and then, then Brian turn to you. Uh, for those uh, watching, I just wanna remind uh, everyone that you can ask questions through the uh, Q&A function. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So as you're listening, if something occurs to you, feel free to just drop the question in. We'll take a look at it now. Um, but Janet, by way of follow-up, um, I'm wondering if you could say more about noia, uh, metanoia in the context of grief and anger. How does metanoia follow from them? Um, uh, oh. or, or, you know, how, how do you uh, think about metanoia in, uh, mm -hmm. in light of, you know, the, the kind of prior conversations we've had? I feel especially like, um, I wanted to ask you this because of your, your great work mm -hmm. in kind of spirituality, but mm -hmm. also um, I feel like we've all experienced grief uh, mm -hmm. My own grandmother died during COVID, and so I had the COVID. She didn't die from COVID, but I had the COVID funeral experience. I, I think we've all experienced anger. That's much of what we've seen. Um, but metanoia, that the sense of uh, turning around or repentance or change, that mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure that seems almost too hopeful, that something's going to happen. And, uh, you know, so how do you um, place metanoia in the kind of sequence of grief and anger? Because it's, uh, I think it's the well, trickiest one to get our hands around. Okay, well, grief and anger are very difficult experiences to go through. And both grief and anger tell us something is very wrong. So, you, you know, we could do nothing about the grief as people were dying and dying and dying, but we should not have had the casualties that we had. It was so poorly managed and all of that. So, so grief also, tends to evoke some people get very sad other people get very angry so grief is a complicated emotion with many many uh, sides to it anger <clears throat> is a response to grief it makes us feel a little bit stronger but it also what happened during the time of the pandemic combined with the disaster the country has been in uh, under the previous administration with the mendacity and all that was going on, is it, it really showed us the underbelly of the country. <clears throat> and it's been a long underbelly of unrepentant racism. And it's still going on. We, we still have, you know, people trying all over the country, trying to prevent other people from their constitutional rights. So on one level, I think the, the anger is, is a huge like ball <laughs> of, you know, everything, you know? I, I mean, some people get angry in the grief stage because you feel stronger than if you're weeping in the sad stage, you know? But, but that anger moves us to change something. And we're either changing the country, changing the rules, changing ourselves and when it occurs what we you know when the call to conversion occurs in the new testament it's always a change toward becoming a disciple becoming a jesus kind of person and and wherever we're failing in becoming and acting out of a jesus kind of person which is you know a universal acceptance of every human being in the world mm -hmm. Uh, whenever that, you know, that really is what the direction the conversion is to. So it's important to look at the Beatitudes. That's what a Jesus kind of person looks like. Mm -hmm. Does that make Does that make sense to you? Yes. And it, it well, Brian, do you want to hop in? Because I did have a. I mean, I think what Janet is absolutely right in terms of. Um, being a moral theologian and a Christian ethicist, I often go back to St. Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas teaches that we can incur the sin of anger in three ways, um, by um, misdirected anger. So we're angry at the wrong thing. So the classic example being that I'm of my students, or we can be angry at excess where anger becomes wrath or rage or vengeance. But he also says that we can sin against anger by deficiency. And it's when we're not angry when we ought to be, because he says anger is the passion that moves the will to justice. And so in a previous um, uh, conversation, we're talking about righteous anger. And I think from the <laughs> Christian tradition, we can take from the fact that all too often injustice flourishes because of a deficit of anger. 
that people aren't angry because as Janet says, anger moves us. It can motivate us. It tells us something is radically wrong here and we need to take action to, to change things. And one of the fears that I have is that um, we're going to reach a point where we want to go back to normal, back to normal, back to the way things are. And we're not going to be um, We apologize, folks. It, it appears we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, we're hoping that we can get uh, our moderator back um, as well as uh, Father Massingale. Um, I think, Matt, uh, you're, you're coming back now. <laughs> and uh, Father Brian Massingale might, might be rebooting as well. Um, Matt, can you hear us? Yes. Um, am I back? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry about that, viewers. Uh, and Brian also had a little bit of trouble still up. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, we can press on. Uh, Janet, I, I heard most of Brian's answer, I think, uh, at least much of it. Um, and uh, I was going to follow up uh, and ask him this question, but uh, something you said in your last answer about the, the ways anger let, uh, uh, kind of forces us to do something or we react to anger, and it can be to change laws, change the country, but it can also be to change ourselves. And I wanted to ask about when we're thinking about metanoia and this turning around, this repentance, this kind of change, change of heart and, and change of direction, uh, what's the connection between the individual and the collective, right? I'm thinking especially of, you know, we, there's been a really renewed emphasis on structures of sin, you know, oppressive structures, uh, sinful structures. Mm -hmm. um, and how, but that seems to be, you know, uh, a slightly different uh, angle into the question than talking about our own individual conversions. So what's the kind of relationship between an individual's conversion or metanoia and or what are the different levels on which this well, can take place? Social conversion, well, what, you know, how do we change a well, society? Well, social change uh, has as, as it has emerged through liberation theology and all of these all of these movements of recognizing that when we discover that things are wrong systemically, when we can do systemic analysis and we can say, okay, this isn't just a bad actor making things worse. This is a whole system that is maintaining a structure of oppression. Mm -hmm. And to change, that's called, we've, we now call that social sin. And, the, and what happens is once you get a structure of oppression into place, then the system works on its own. And people either maintain the system, are injured by the system, or have to work to change the system. Mm -hmm. And the work of social change is very hard uh, bec because you have so many actors and you have so many um, systems, processes, everything in place <clears throat> that wants to keep it in place. Now, what, what we've really learned uh, through, especially through Latin American theology and uh, work in third world countries, as, as well as all the work on racism in this country, is that social change only happens with, with people coming together to make that change. And it's a long and slower process of change than individual conversion. So individuals wake up and say, this is terrible. Why is this situation going on? And then it takes collective and concerted action to create the, the social changes necessary within whatever uh, governmental system or whatever system you're trying to make the changes in. They go together. And, and I think the pandemic uh, has, you know, kind of let out all of our demons. There are certain people in our culture who experience that pressure all the time, who experience the limitation of their, 
well, just this whole thing over uh, making it harder to vote for people. So the most oppressed people get another level of oppression put on them by what's happening in the system. Right. Now to change that takes a very big collective. Now we've had a wake up call with George Floyd. We've had, well, and, and it's not just George Floyd, it's the host of, you know, <clears throat> more than a dozen prob probably well-known uh, instances of black people being terribly oppressed and, and, and dead. Yeah. Uh, so it takes also a kind of uh, social change of view to change structures and that's a longer process. And, and we're kind yeah. of, we're at the work now of trying to reclaim the nation. Sure. In our democracy itself so that it works to the benefit mm -hmm. of everyone. Sure. Uh, Brian, welcome back. I see we have the same problem. Um, uh, I caught right. most of your answer and I wanted to, you know, if there's anything you didn't get to say you wanted to, you can kind of put it in here. But the question I had just asked Janet, which was actually the question I, I uh, hope to ask you, um, uh, is uh, on the relationship between um, the kind of individual and structural when we talk about metanoia. I'm glad you pointed out that you, you, you didn't like the word conversion. Because I feel like in the American context, you know, that has such a like altar call, ask Jesus into your heart, one quick thing, you're saved, right? It's a conversions like a road to Damascus moment in a way. Um, uh, but how does, uh, and, and I think when we talk about conversion, it, we tend to think of individuals. But what if, if we're thinking about metanoia in the context of this time of reckoning, what is the relationship between an individual change of heart or turning around? and change at a structural level. Uh, we hear so much about structural sin, structural racism. What does, the, what, what does that turning around look like at kind of both levels, the individual and then a more structural and collective level? I think it was Gustavo Gutierrez who talks about conversion and metanoia as being a fundamental break, as being a break with how we've defined ourselves and how we see ourselves. And I think especially in given the, the, the context of, um, of the, the, the long, tragic, sad, infuriating history of African-American lives being killed and even murdered with impunity, it means that we have to fundamentally look at how do we define ourselves as Americans, and especially I'm going to be blunt here, as white Americans. How do white Americans understand who they are? And part of it is that, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the voting, the voter suppression um, activities going on, in terms of resistance to police reform, um, the resistance to any kind of accountability for January 6th, is that we have underneath all of those individual things, there's a hesitancy, a resistance at the changing understanding of America and American demography, that we're no longer a white Christian nation and many white Christians are angry, nervous, upset and infuriating. And they've decided that if America means having a multiracial democracy, then that's not what they're down for. And so I think what we're seeing it's both at the individual level and the collective level is that we, white Americans cannot understand themselves as being fundamentally white if white means um, unacknowledged or unexamined privilege. Um, shortly after the murder of George Floyd, I wrote an article in which I talked about, you know, the, the challenge of whiteness. And I said that, you know, if we're up to people of color, Racism would have been over and done, you know, a long time ago. And that the only reasons for the persistence of racism in this country is because white Americans benefit from it, not as individuals perhaps, but certainly as a collective. And so how does the individual and the collective work here? Um, I gave a talk recently where I said, not all white Americans are racist but all too many are cowards. And that is they're in situations where they hear racist remarks. 
where they see racist things being done, but they won't challenge them. They won't say anything. They'll make excuses such as, well, deep down, he's really a nice person, or that's just the way she was raised, or it was just a joke. If we're going to have the larger scale kind of metanoia of moving to being a genuinely multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, then it's also going to depend upon not only the systemic kinds of organizing that we do, it's going to also depend upon the individual change of heart. And that is that I am not going to define myself by my tribal loyalties, that I'm going to break out of my comfort zone and I'm going to perhaps say the difficult thing, raise the difficult question that's going to say that there's no, so there's no safe harbor for racist attitudes and beliefs. Because as I tell my students, they're going to, my mostly white students at Fordham, that they're going to see and hear more naked racial animus than I will. Because when I'm in the room, everyone knows how to behave. And there's certain things that people aren't going to say. And so the challenge of individual metanoia is, what do you do when I'm not in the room and these things are said? And so there's a, that's the relationship with the individual change and transformation that then is a part and parcel to the more social change and transformation because we don't change in ourselves individually, then we're never going to reach the point where we have a genuinely change, transform, racially just society. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind viewers that they can be sending in questions in the Q&A. We're actually going to start with that in a few, in a few moments. Um, but before we do, uh, I, I want to ask one more question before the Q&A. Um, and uh, maybe we can keep our answers on the shorter side, even though it's a, probably a, one of the more difficult questions I've asked, or a complex <laughs> one. But um, uh, I, I mean, listen to both of your, your last answers, Brian, some of your comments. You know, um, it is true that, uh, you know, confronting sin is uncomfortable, right? It's hard, whether individually or collectively, because our identity is bound up with both. And, um, you know, I was, I, I was talking to a, a, the wheel group last night. Uh, they were a bit of a focus group for this conversation. And, but I was reminded of, you know, my dad's, one of my dad's great lines he always used to say is, Matt, the same sun that melts the ice also hardens clay. And I've been wondering about you know, why this moment where we've seen so much in front of our eyes that we've, you know, we've saw the video of George Floyd being murdered. I live in New York. I saw the refrigerator trucks outside the, mor or the morgues because there wasn't enough room. And yet this moment has not caused a kind of rec recognition of a shared reality. It's realizing what we have in common, realizing how much we need each other, realizing in the sense that we're either all saved together or we're not saved at all. And uh, I'm wondering, especially as um, both of you, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, devoted your lives to the church, <laughs> right? Um, to, to, to thinking about spirituality and our religious lives as they connect to some of these broader questions um, as, as kind of uh, pastors and shepherds and, you know, people who guide people spiritually, what's going on there? What, and how could, you know, maybe our religious leaders we'll talk about our own church, the Roman Catholic Church, treated their flock in a way that let them navigate what was happening in, in a way that maybe this could have been processed differently. Maybe it wouldn't have, you know, how, what's the difference between melting the, the ice or hardening the clay? You know, what's, what's going on when we resist uh, metanoia, resist kind of taking account of what's happening and changing, um, when we resist that, but when it, when it actually happens too. What's going on spiritually? What's, could you speak to those uh, kinds of questions? And you want uh, answers on the shorter side. <laughs> I know, Let's scrap that. I, I'm sorry, okay. go for it. Chad, did you want to begin? Yeah, I, I'd like to begin and I'd like to begin, I mean, in a slightly different way to that question. Sure. And, and it really has to do with what is it that blocks basic empathy toward another human being, no matter who they are or what they look like. And if this is something that um, um, drives me crazy because I can't understand how we can be 
so glib in not conferring humanity on another person, no matter what they look like or where, come, where they come from, and especially another human being who is suffering. And in this pandemic, we had everybody suffering, but especially we had suffering people of non-white, primarily non-white in terms of the emergency workers and all of the people who are making everything work and who were most exposed to the COVID uh, pathogen and all of, all of that place. I, I just cannot understand that block of a, of a universal concern for other people. And it's fundamental to the gospel. I mean, if the gospel was about anything and Jesus's ministry was about anything, it was the message to the Gentiles that went out after Jesus died. <clears throat> so after developing a group of followers of a more inclusive community, Christianity was from a very early stage open to others. And there's something so severely wrong with us if, if you know, as multiple individuals, we can't respond to a suffering human being with empathy and compassion and want them to be treated the same way we are. Um, it's probably why I'm the sister of mercy. <laughs> I've, had lots, I've had lots of practice, but I've had also, I've had lots of experience with people from many, many different cultures. And I've been all over the world or not all over the world. I've been to three continents brought by students and, um, and have what was hardest for me when I was in New York City was experiencing what the African clergy were who were in my classes were experiencing um, in the church system itself. Their pastors were leaving them with the whole parish and going off without warning when they were supposed to be students. They, they were being abused in their system. And in my own uh, Italian American neighbor, Italian Jewish neighborhood in the Bronx where I was living, I had one, one of my um, uh, African clergymen was waiting for a peer supervision group in uh, spiritual direction. And he left because I couldn't get home from school in time to let him in. And he did not feel safe in my neighborhood. I never felt unsafe in my neighborhood, but, but my Italian American landlady, all I had to say to her was, any, anyone with a collar who knocks on my door, no matter what they look like, let them in, whether I'm here or not. I mean, it's like I had to figure out a way to protect him. But so many of, you know, the Indian clergy were the same in which they were, you know, uh, treated poorly uh, within the clergy system in, in New York City. So I, I want to, I mean, I spend my life kind of trying to help people treat every other human being as another self, as they themselves would wanna be treated in that same situation and, and to try to build understanding across different groups. So that becomes doable and possible. Um, Thank you. Brian, Brian, do you wanna hop in on this yeah. one? Um, I wanna go back to your question in terms of what could our faith leaders have done to help shepherd us through this crisis um, and lead us to the kind of collective and individual metanoia that is needed and called for at this moment. And I could be very, very critical of our faith leaders and, and deservedly so. I think that um, the US bishops collectively have, have dropped the ball on this, have not led us well. Um, I think that their continued fixation, for example, with their, after their last disastrous meeting, when they divided to, you know, basically devote themselves to partisan politics and weaponize the Eucharist um, is, an, is an example of that. But I want to go, I want to change our focus because I think, sometimes I think we think that ordained bishops and clergy are the only leaders in the, in the Christian community in the Catholic Church. And over the pandemic, I was struck by how creative people were with worshiping, not with televising the mass, 
but with, for example, the um, Baltimore sisters, uh, the Carmel, the Baltimore Carmelites would host um, a weekly Lectio Divina that people would, would gather, you know, over 100, 200 people would gather to pray over the Sunday scriptures. And they would have someone, a lay person often lead the reflection. Other places have experiment with liturgy of the word and people have talked about how rich those, those experiences were. And what we saw was that people have, have begun to appreciate the Eucharist not simply as being the act of sanctifying the host, but the Eucharist being the encounter with the word of God present in this virtual community. And in those kinds of places, one, one saw people shepherding each other, supporting each other, challenging one another. And I think that there are new ways of being church that have been born out of this experience that we've been in that we've not yet had time to really process and, and to really grasp yet. And so I think that in terms of, yes, when we look at the official leadership of the church, there is much to be disappointed and dismayed about. Um, but if we look at, take a deeper look, and I think that also goes back to something that Jesus did when he talked about the kingdom of God, the reign of God breaking in, he talked about the mustard seed or the seed growing silently of itself. He pointed to conversion, metanoia happens in unnoticed and very small ways that then blossom beyond our expectations. And so I think that a new way of, be, of church is being born out of this. And I also think that it's going to take our leaders some time, if ever, to really grasp that things have fundamentally shifted in ways that they can't quite, that none of us can quite name yet, but which I'm, I am almost certain are real. Um, Matthew, you seem to be Sorry. muted. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you for that, Brian. And it's a, it's a good segue to some of the questions uh, that have been uh, asked. And I feel like there's just a number of questions from listeners, some more personal, some more practical uh, of uh, viewers writing in saying, uh, how can I turn to the church, you know, the, uh, during these difficult times uh, when I turn there and I see the racism and misogyny and same problems, you know, that are in the broader society. It's not really an alternative in they, so they, they're upset and they turn to their church and they become more upset, right? When they see, you know, the, the spectacle that was the bishop's meeting uh, last week, I believe, you know, um, when that's what the church is, or the, the uh, at least the public image of a lot of the church in, the, in terms of the hierarchy, what would you tell to the, what would you say to the people writing in asking kind of almost pleading, uh, what can I do for spiritual sustenance uh, uh, and, and nourishment right now if I feel you know, that the problems I'm, I'm seeking nourishment to, to help work through are also present in the church. What would you say to, uh, to those kinds of questions that viewers are bringing? Janet, do you wanna start and then Brian follow up? Yeah, I, I can start with that. Partly, it, I think some of the most effective things that happen are small faith communities who do not depend on the, on the clergy or, or on the um, a kind of official part of the church. So um, anyway, sp uh, spiritual direction helps, group spiritual direction helps. There's all kinds of ways people can gather in small groups and, and nourish one another. Um, I, it, it's astounding to me that sometimes um, uh, in a, a place like New York City, for instance, there, there are communities that have always been hospitable. Uh, St. Ignatius and uh, St. Francis Xavier have very flourishing subgroups within them and are animated communities. There's, there's many other ones as well. So I, I think it is you know, incumbent to in, encourage the initiative of lay people to meet and support with one another. Um, I know I always, um, uh, uh, even if I was on a Zoom, I, I, would, I would get hosts from the mother house and I would have my own communion, but I was connected to the commun my own community that I couldn't worship with at the time. 
but our, our sisters there were conducting their own communion services and reflecting on the word. Um, so in, some, in, in many ways, I, I think the building of small Christian communities is incumbent on us in order to um, uh, maximize lay leadership, but also to not have the, the laity dependent on clergy for everything because they just don't have the capacity um, to, first of all, they don't have the capacity to respond to all of it, but most of them have not been trained in those smaller group processes from, from my experience. And they're overwhelmed with just the, with the liturgical ministries itself and the running of, you know, of big parishes. So there's, there's a way in which I think we can be too harsh because yeah. on, on judging what was or wasn't happening in the church because of the overwhelming amount of death that was occurring. Yeah. So you had all these people who were grieving, who couldn't do the funerals. It, it, it just was a, a, you know, sure. a, a very difficult time before we began to, to drop off from that. So I, I think there is a, a tremendous need to develop um, a broader notions of what church looks like and what lay people can do on their own with one another. Um, sure, thanks. Um, yeah. I, I think that's a great segue, oh, to you, Brian. Can I add one small wrinkle to you to your um, before you reply? Because so one, I think it is connected. Someone wrote in and specifically asked you, uh, Father Massingale, could you talk about allyship and how those outside our communities of color can be transformative allies while still being respectful of uh, spaces and experience of people of color. And I feel like if we're doing church in new ways or, you know, lay people are more involved, I just thought that might be one kind of wrinkle as you answer, maybe you can get to it for people that's who a lot like of, to, want to do, you know. That's a lot of wrinkles. Okay. Yeah, could you try to solve this in maybe two or three minutes? Yeah, let's try to solve it. Um, going back to, <laughs> I think that one mantra that helps me in moments of difficulty with um, the church and frustration with its leadership or whatever I have a mantra that it goes something like this. God is infinitely bigger than the church. And the church is vastly bigger than its bishops. And I think that as Catholics, sometimes, even though we talk, we are against clericalism, I think sometimes we fall into that clerical trap of identifying the church with the actions or non-actions of the bishops. And when we look at the bishops, yeah, and it, as Janet says rightly, that we shouldn't be too harsh on clerical leadership because they were going through an unprecedented experience as well. But I do think what, what some questioners are raising is that like, they're surfing a long simmering sense of frustration with the, with the official leadership. And yeah, that can be very difficult to look to the church for guidance except then what are we looking toward? Where, what are we seeing when we see church? And so let's take an example, um, the controversy over blessing same-sex unions and the infamous document from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith that said that the church cannot do this because God cannot bless sin. What happened? Almost spontaneously, there was this eruption from among the people of God that said, that's wrong. And so perhaps for the first time since 1968, you saw this kind of widespread rejection of that kind of document. To me, that speaks of the vitality of the church. So yes, on the other hand, you got this kind of official pronouncement that was, you know, that was very hurtful and harmful to members of the LGBTQ community and to those who love them and to their allies. And then on the other, you had this widespread kind of uprising of the spirit that said, that's not who we are. And you saw around the world, people gathering to bless unions and they say, well, wait a minute, the, the clergy aren't the only people who can bless people. I remember being in fifth grade and Sister Mary Magna would bless us with holy water all the time before we left for the day. And so I, mean, I think we're calling who is church and where we find church. And that leads us then to allyship then. 
One of the first things of allyship, and this goes back to something that Janet said earlier, listening, but listening to what? Listening to the pain, listening to the brokenness and allowing that brokenness, that pain to break you. All too often, I think when white people hear about you know, what the, the horrors that people of color have been living in that aren't news to us. Their immediate thing is, what can I do to fix it? And my first reaction is, if you want to be a good ally, listen and then sit in the pain of the discomfort. Let that pain break you open. Let it move you to righteous anger, to genuine sorrow. Because if you want to jump right away to the, the solution, then that kind of activism, that kind of um, fervor soon burns out when you encounter resistance. And you will encounter resistance. But if you sit and listen, and listen to the pain, listen to the fear, and I'll be speaking as a black man in America, after Ahmed Arbery was killed for jogging, just going for a run for taking care of his health. For weeks on end, when I would go out for my daily walk, I would be looking around me. I was living in fear. And it's only when you listen to the fear and allow that fear to break you open, then you can be a good ally. I don't even like that term ally. I want someone that's going to accompany me in the journey of transformation. Ally sounds too distant for me. I want someone to be an accomplice. I want us to be accomplices <laughs> in the work of subverting our nation and changing our nation to breaking our nation open to being more and more what it says it is a nation where, of liberty and justice for all and not just for some. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really, uh, I needed to hear that. I don't know how we can follow up uh, from that, but there was a question actually um, that, that came to mind while you were talking, Brian, which is uh, someone wrote in and said, um, grief and anger have certainly played a role in how people have reacted to the events of the past year. But I also think fear played a primary role. How do you think we can help ourselves and others to overcome fear and embrace the challenge of metanoia? And I was, I thought of that question in part because Brian, you said, you know, you were afraid and you're, you're walking around certain places, but um, lots of people were afraid of different kinds of things, uh, you know, maybe less, uh, less justified fear. And uh, I, you know, I, I think this, you know, a few years ago, Marilyn Robinson, I think uh, either it was in, in an interview or an essay she wrote for the New York Review of Books, um, talked about fear. And she said, fear is not a Christian habit of mind. <laughs> uh, but I wonder, what do you think people were afraid of this past year? All, all different kinds of people, right? It will different, be different from one group to the next. Um, and what, as a Christian, do you say to fear? Brian, you got at that a little bit in your, your last answer there. But um, you know, that question of fear, we have talked about grief and we talked about anger, but fear is a really important uh, emotion in the mix. And I think it is related to metanoia in interesting ways. So maybe both of you, uh, Brian, you could get us started this time and speak to that. Sure. Yeah, I think that I'm glad you, you raised that question because I think that um, fear can get a bad rap sometimes. Um, but in the Gospels, Jesus is constantly saying, do not be afraid. And I take comfort in that because he wouldn't tell us not to fear if we weren't afraid. So okay, so let's admit the fear. But then it's important to understand what are we afraid of? And there are different people of different groups are, have, have different kinds of fear. After President Trump was elected in 2016, um, I had to teach class the day after the election. And I was like, what am I going to say to my students? I'm teaching Catholic social teaching. My students are all like completely anxious and upset. And I said, let's just talk about the fears that different groups had. So we identified the fears that African-Americans had. 
fears that the that the that people who are immigrants had, fear that women had at having this person elected who is guilty of saying misogynistic and doing misogynistic things. And we talked about the fears of white working class people as well, who fear that they've been given a raw deal in life, and they have been, but they've been told that that raw deal is due to the fact that gays are now um, becoming ascendant, that black people are getting ascendancy, that immigrants are getting something that they're not getting. All of these fears. And I think what we need to resurface here is the virtue of courage. Because it's interesting, I've been doing some, a lot of work on courage. And I found out that courage is the one virtue that's, that's the least studied by Christian theologians. And courage is not the absence of fear. The times when I look at my life where I've been most courageous as in terms of outside people have been the times when I have been inside shaking. I've been chilled. I've been like, what am I doing? Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is that ability, that gift of the spirit that enables us to push through fear and enables us to translate our moral convictions into action. Oftentimes what separates those who act and those who don't are not their convictions. They all believe that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. However, fear holds them back from acting on those convictions. And I think that we don't often talk enough about courage and helping people to become courageous and realizing that courage is something that's rarely done on my own, that it's also done in community by family, friends, um, you know, close community support that enables us to be courageous. And I think that part of, we don't talk enough about the importance of courage as both a fruit of metanoia, but also courage as being that which enables us to make the profound changes that metanoia calls for. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Janet, um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. It's uh, just, I do want to remind everyone, uh, this ends at about four, it's 3.52. So I thought what would happen is, uh, Janet, you can answer this question. I have one last question for each of you that's short, and then we'll hand it over to, uh, 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 to Milton or Dominic or whoever's uh, stepping in. So uh, Janet, answer, and then I'll, I'll follow up with one more with each of you. Okay. So my question? Were you, were you wanting me to respond? Uh, I was, uh, well, you can talk about whatever you'd like, no. uh, but I, the fear, especially um, any part of, uh, you know, the fear question or anything you just wanted to say in response to Brian's uh, last couple of remarks, which were, were very rich and I found, you know, uh, provocative. Yeah, well, well what, I, what I wanna say um, is that um, when we are living in, an active relationship with God, and we know that interiorly. That is a that is a place of uh, courage, because we know we're not alone. I mean, you know, all throughout the gospel, it's do not be afraid. You know, and I, I mean, we and we have you know the poor disciples in the boat with Jesus, and the the boat's going down, and Jesus isn't worried. <laughs> And Jesus calms the storm. So, um, so it's so I think that um, overcoming the the fear is the courage that comes that comes from from Jesus. I think the other place that courage comes from is is that uh, a kind of a basic empowerment. I mean, I have a lot of experience of being a woman in the church. That isn't a whole lot of fun. Uh, and uh, I've spent a whole lot of time doing things I never was supposed to do. So I've preached in more places than you know many clergy preach because I take any opportunity that comes along. We create situations for each other in my community. We preach for all our own chapters, all our, all our services that we have, our jubilees. We, we preach within our own community. So there is a way of moving toward um, seeing what needs to happen 
and finding a way to respond in a particular in in a in an effective way. So uh, so I think you know um, in in some ways and some parts of the country are different than other parts of the country in terms of how how people have historically responded uh, within church systems. But there's an enormous amount happening in small Christian communities and gathered people who are simply doing what needs to be done. Um, there's also, I think, even when, even when we feel afraid that there are situations where I know I just needed to act. I mean, and I've intervened <laughs> in fights. I've intervened in a whole bunch of places and trusting that I, if I stood in my own authority, it would so shock the other person <laughs> that it would, you know, that it would kind of dissipate, you know. So I, I think in, in many ways, um, I, I think this time of the pandemic has actually impaired some of that. What I want to, what I want to say is by impaired, you know, we were all supposed to stay away. We couldn't do the accompaniment that was part of our normal responses in our communities of care and concern and, and outreach. outreach. Um, on, the, on the other hand, um, it's, in, it's important for all of us to discern what it is we actually can do. Now, the conditions of the pandemic meant we couldn't be with each other. So we had to develop new ways of supporting each other, being with each other. You know, I had students, uh, former students that I was seeing for spiritual direction. They were doing pastoral accompaniment in the hospital on Zoom. They, they were finding ways to be present and to minister to other people um, in ways that protected them, but, but which made them available to the community. So if we, so, but I think that requires, how should I put it, imagination, not getting stuck on what is and creating alternatives. And many of those can be done from the ground up. They don't need anybody's permission to do. I so- I like the idea of not asking permission sometimes, <laughs> especially coming from you, Janet. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's now 3.57, uh, we're almost done, but a number of people have written in asking, um, in the, everything we've been talking about, they want something to read next, they want something to do next, and I feel like it's, you know, we've, we've uh, stressed that metanoia is not like a, just a one-time quick thing, it's ongoing, right? And so as, 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 uh, as our viewers walk away from not just this conversation, but all three of them, do you have any, um, you don't have to give them a book assignment. Um, I know you're both professors, so, you know, uh, well, maybe we'll do that, but, or a, a mantra, uh, a something to think about, um, a passage of scripture you especially love that's been meaningful to you these past time or, or whatever it might be, just something very quick because we have to wrap up, but something yeah. they can take away with them. Okay, I, I want to say Fratelli Tutti. It's a uh, good one. <laughs> Well, no, and, and to not be put off by how long it is. I have read it and reread it. It is one of the most amazing pieces I've ever seen. And in a Fratelli Tutte, uh, Francis over and over again comes to this core of compassion and the story of the Good Samaritan. So you don't have to read the whole thing. You can get it online is look at his descriptions of the Good Samaritan and, and his uh, reflections on it. It's, it's worth praying with and going deeper with. So I, uh, I heartily agree. And uh, just a side comment, that, that uh, document has been, its reception in the US church has seemed, seems to have been almost non-existent. You know, so I really, I really urge everyone to read it because uh, it, it should have gotten more attention. Brian? I would echo Fratelli Tutti, but I would also recommend uh, Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem that she read at, at Biden's inauguration. Um, that poem from this girl, this African-American young woman, who at the height of just after the insurrection, she's talking about looking toward a new dawn and a new morning. Um, it says that there's hope. And I think that's the thing about metanoia. 
metanoia, we boil it all down to it. It's religious shorthand for the fact that reality is not a closed system, that there's change is always possible. There's always the possibility of renewal. And I think that that poem captures it. And the one scripture passage I would point out would be from the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, verses one through six, where Jesus says, I come to make all things new. I think that that's what we need to kind of hold on to. Metanoia is not only a challenge for us, metanoia is also the hope that reality is not a closed system and that there is always the possibility, even when the things look the bleakest, that there is something going on where God is doing something that we can't even imagine, but that's, what, but that's the kind of hope we can take that what we're, what we're living in now, we're not stuck in. And I think that's something we need to take away from the, the three series of events we've been looking at in terms of the spirituality after all of this, you know, horror, horror that we've lived through. Thank you so, so much. Uh, Milton, I, I hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you, Janet and, and Brian. Um, I just wanted to say once again to our audience, uh, thank you for walking with us, journeying with us throughout this time. And I would also, again, uh, like to thank Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid and Monsignor Turo Bañuelas, who gave us the talk on grief, moderated by Claudia Avila Casnahan, and Dr. Cecilia Gonzalez Andreo and Dr. Marcia Chatelain, uh, who also spoke to us on righteous anger, and moderated by Vincent Cunningham. And again today, Janet, Matt, Brian, thank you so much for these uh, conversations, these thoughts, and uh, for our audience until uh, next time. Thank you so much for attending these events. Bye now.